Hello, we're going to tackle the issue of moral crime in the 1600s now, and to do this I need to introduce you to these people. Now, you've seen how in the 1500s religion hopped between Catholic and Protestant, and you will have worked out by now that people could be more or less Catholic and more or less Protestant. Now, these are the Puritans, and they're what we would call radical or extreme Protestants. They're about as Protestant as it is possible to be. And they're growing in numbers from about the end of the 1500s. But they don't have a lot of freedom. So in 1620, for example, a group of them moved to America to in the pursuit of more religious freedom and end up becoming the Pilgrim Fathers in American history. But they do grow in political power during the 1600s. And that's because partly of an event called the English Civil Wars. So it's partly because there's more of them and there's partly because of this series of battles that happened between 1642 and 1648. And these take place between the king at the time, whose name is Charles I, he's a Stuart, son of James I, and Parliament, who has been increasingly disagreeing with him about the way that he runs the country. So. Like all civil wars, it's a pretty horrible event. Um, it's very disruptive, it's very divisive. Um, in some cases, brothers end up fighting against brothers. And then families are divided. Kills tens of thousands of people. But at the end of it, Charles is defeated. And that's partly because of this man. His name is Oliver Cromwell. And he emerges as the military leader of the parliamentarians. And remains the leader after that. So Charles is put on trial for treason by Parliament and found guilty and publicly executed by beheading. And then between the years of 1649 and 1660, there is no king of England. And instead, Parliament run, runs the country under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell, who is now known as the Lord Protector of England. So this is called the Protectorate. And Cromwell and a lot of MPs, a lot of members of Parliament, are Puritan, which means that the Puritans go from controlling Parliament in the 1640s to controlling the whole country in the 1650s. And a lot of the laws that they introduce reflect their beliefs. Now, to the Puritans, they believe that people should follow the law of the Bible very closely. And they also believe that people should try to keep their minds on the next life and going to heaven and what's going to happen to them in eternity and not to get distracted by all the fun and interesting things that you might be able to do in the world. So they believe that people should be godly and not worldly. Um, but this means that a lot of behaviours that were considered really quite normal at the time, like drinking and dancing and gambling and swearing and sex outside of marriage, are considered to be a sin by the Puritans. I think in their defence, because um, they get a bad rap to the Puritans, and if you look at how I've drawn them here, I've drawn them really quite, looking quite strict and quite stern. Um, at this point, England has been controlled by a combination of religion and law, firstly by the Roman Catholic Church, then by the kings and queens of the 1500s. Um, so that's something that has been happening anyway. And they're also genuinely concerned with saving people's souls and saving people from behaviour that might lead them into hell. So I think that's something that needs to be borne in mind with this. But basically, they introduce a lot of laws to ensure that people are living really, really holy lives. And they get rid of a lot of things that people consider to be quite normal and really enjoyed. So, for example, they strengthen and really enforce a lot of existing laws about drunkenness and swearing. They also ban um, horse racing, bear baiting and cockerel fighting not because they're cruel, although things like bear baiting were certainly very cruel, but because people enjoyed them too much and it was too much of a distraction from God. And also because if people are 
getting together in big crowds, then they might end up getting drunk, they might end up gambling and committing other sins. They also, in 1642, ban all the theatres in London because again, big groups of people like, might lead to immorality and also because it's too enjoyable. It keeps people's minds on this life too much and not the next. Now, the how rigorous these laws are depends on how many Puritans were controlling local law. Um, so, for example, in some areas there were Puritan soldiers patrolling the streets and because makeup was banned on women, they would push their heads down into the pond and scrub the makeup off. Um, they also have very strict laws on, about Sunday. So Sunday is seen by the Puritans as a really holy day and it's a day for resting and for thinking about God. So anything that might be considered work or a distraction becomes illegal. So for example, if you're caught mending a dress on a Sunday, then you could find yourself in the stocks. If you have your hair cut or your beard trimmed on a Sunday, then you could be fined. If you played football or any other sort of a, a sport on Sunday, then you could be whipped. And this is important because people used to meet up after church and play sports like football or wrestling or pike throwing. Also, walking somewhere, if it's not to and from church, was also considered to be work and was also punished by a fine. So in really strongly Puritan areas where Puritans are controlling law and order, people could be fined even for things like talking in the street when they should have been in church. Um, in one case, somebody was criminalized for putting dirt down the back of somebody else's shirt. So that depends on local law However, Parliament does introduce a series of laws as well. So I'll give you some examples of these as well. Um, for example, in 1642, May Day celebrations are banned. So when people used to have a day off and have a festival on the 1st of May, that is then banned by the Puritans and by Parliament. Um, through the 1640s, they're also running a campaign to try and ban Christmas as well. So their reasoning behind this, and they feel the same way about Easter and Whitsun, is that Christmas isn't really a Christian festival. Christmas is actually a pagan festival that people just shuggled around a little bit to make it Christian so they could carry on celebrating it. And so they see it, see it as quite blasphemous and it becomes illegal to have holly in your house or to eat pudding or meat or a special meal on Christmas Day or to sing carols. Um, and instead, to make up for losing Christmas, they introduce a new holiday which is on the second Tuesday of every month. The problem is, it's non-religious, but it's really for people to fast and not eat anything and to think about God. So they don't consider it to be an adequate substitute, really. Um, I'm not sure how very strongly this was, you know, how successful this was, really. Um, they expected shopkeepers to stay open on Christmas Day, for example, and shopkeepers just refused and closed their shops anyway. Um, there are reports from 1654 that Christmas celebrations lasted for a week. So I'm not sure how much it worked and whether they could get people to go along with it, but they are certainly passing laws to try. Now in 1650, they passed laws to um, make adultery and swearing illegal. Swearing, you could be punished by a fine, but if you repeat offended, and you continue to swear after this, you could end up being thrown into prison. Adultery, on the other hand, is made a crime that is punishable by death. So if you cheated on your husband or wife, you could find yourself being hanged. In 1653, they ban weddings in church. So that's 1650 there. Um, because that's not what churches are for. Churches are for worshipping God. 
but they do then repeal that and get rid of it, get rid of that law in 1657. Also in 1657, it becomes illegal for pubs to have gambling. Sorry, 1657, I'll write it there instead. Um, and it's illegal to have gambling or music even in alehouses. And actually, under the Puritans, an awful lot of alehouses are closed down anyway because people should not be getting drunk. So you can see how many laws the Puritans are introducing and enforcing in terms of people's behaviour. Now, they do also allow people more freedom in some ways. So although you can't be a Catholic um, under the Puritans, they do get rid of the crime of recusancy which is not going to church. And people do have freedom to, so decriminalize, that means it's made not criminal. So people do have the freedom to explore their own religious beliefs and find new ways of worshiping um, and more freedom than they had had before. But overall, the Puritans laws are really not at all popular in England. And when Cromwell dies, there are reports that say it was the joyfulest funeral I ever saw. After Cromwell's death, they bring back Charles I's son in 1660, and he immediately brings back all the things that the Puritans had banned, and is loved by the people of England for it. So these changes aren't long-lasting, um, but they're certainly very significant in the 1640s and 50s.